Hello and welcome to another video. In this one, I'm going to be talking about literal string. Uh, I've actually talked about this in another video before uh, when I talked about things that are new in Python 3.11. Um, and spoilers, I actually kind of introduced the same idea a few years before it existed in this video here. Um, but we'll talk about that in a bit once we've actually dove into what it's about and uh, go from there. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> given the first recording that I just did of this video. It turns out MyPy doesn't support this yet, so we're going to be using PyWrite to demo literal string and talk about it in our little examples here. Um, but okay, all of that out of the way, let's talk about the basic idea of literal string. The idea of this is to write functions that take string parameters, but force them to only come from a context where the programmer has vetted the actual values of the string. They are literals. They are uh, programmer written constants in the code, meaning that they can't come from user generated strings. They're not, you know, uh, query parameters in uh, API endpoint. They're not, you know, command line arguments. They're not something where an external value comes into your program and can influence this. And so this provides a really, really unique opportunity where you can sort of force a safer context for stuff that might not be safe otherwise. Uh, or at least that's the way that I like to think about it. And this is one of the, the first things in the type system that I think is, is sort of along this lines. I mean, there's also new type and a few other similar things, but this, this I think is really aimed at being able to write code in a safer manner uh, beyond just your normal type checking. This gives you another powerful tool in the toolbox to enforce that things are safer. Um, but let's, uh, let's show an example and then we'll try and uh, show how it works with the type checker. And uh, after that, we'll show why my old puzzle video from three years ago, which was, what, uh, a year and a half before this landed in Python, um, why this had some of the same ideas and how I went about solving it before a literal string exists. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's show a little example. This is actually going to come from some work code that I wrote recently. It's not going to be exactly the same as the work code, so uh, bear with me on that, but it'll be pretty close. And the word code, I'm converting a bunch of tables from one JSON type to another. And so I have to do a SQL query to modify the underlying type. Uh, and because I'm doing a bunch of different tables with a bunch of different columns, I've written a little function that converts them. We're just going to use stir as the annotation here just to show why it doesn't work nicely if you just do this. Uh, and then we'll use literal string afterwards to show how the type checker can help us here. Um, the query is something like, I don't remember the exact query, but. To try it. We're going to try and write SQL from memory. Uh, from <laughs> alter table table, uh, alter column column, uh, type JSON B using column. Let me that off screen. So we'll, uh, something, something like that. Semicolon. <laughs> so this is sort of what the SQL query looks like. And because I'm doing this over and over, I don't really want to write out the SQL query over and over. Uh, and the ORM doesn't really help me here because the ORM doesn't give me an operation that does this particular thing. So I had to write manual SQL. Uh, and you'll notice that if I were to pass in user-generated content here, we don't really have any escaping or anything. So this, you know, <laughs> I guess f-string SQL query should set off alarm, bell alarm bells in your head. But we're going to try and make this safe in a way that you could use something like this. Now, if we uh, just called this function with user-generated input, so if we said like input table, input column, uh, and then printed out the result, you know, user-generated input here, uh, and let's actually install PyWrite, which we're going to be using today. PyWrite is a different type checker that I usually don't use, uh, but it happens to have the feature implemented, so we're going to be using it today. You'll see there are no errors in the way this code is written right now, which is fine. And we're passing in strings. Let's say the table is called, I don't know, users, and the column is called metadata. And we get a you know, query that works. Great. But a nefarious user might say that the table is called users semicolon drop table users, uh, I don't know, dash dash something, and the column is called I don't care. Uh, and you can see here that we end up with a, a nefarious, oh, I should have put a semicolon there. Oh, well, pretend I put a semicolon there. Uh, you end up with a nefarious query that uh, just drops your user table. Uh, 
Um, and so this is like an example where you don't have sanitized input. The type checker was okay with it, um, but this new feature allows us to box that out. So let's try using the new feature instead. So instead of stir, we're going to put replace this with literal string. Literal string. Uh, literal string. Uh, and now, PyWrite should. Please tell me PyWrite implemented this. Yay! Hooray! Right, perfect. You can see PyWrite is now properly boxing out those particular types. We are not allowed to pass in a variable stir into this function. Uh, and you know, if we instead wrote to JSONB out with a literal value, users and uh, metadata, which is four, uh, PyWrite is happy with that, which is great. So this this allows you to have uh, you know, to force you to have programmer written values and with some assumption that the programmer is doing reasonable things, you know, maybe it went through code review, like this forces you to have a static value that's being passed this function here. And so in a way, it forces this to be safe or safer. You know, not truly safe because the programmer could still make a mistake, but in this case, it's not, it's not user generated content. It's not coming from someone else. Uh, and so you can sort of find that. This is probably like the flagship use case of literal string, but I actually think there's a few other cases that I really like to demo as well. Uh, the next one, or the next use case that I have, and actually let's, let's take a little segue here before I show you two other use cases. This is almost exactly the same puzzle problem uh, that I wrote in this video here. This is from my old defunct puzzles uh, <laughs> series, which I have since uh, discontinued in a way. Um, but it was basically the same problem, you know, without all of this, you know, allows you to call a function with a literal string, but disallows a variable, an F string, a formatted string, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the, the prompt was like, write a either Flake 8 plugin or MyPy plugin to solve this. Um, and I actually ended up trying to solve this with both of them. I wrote a Flake 8 plugin, which analyzed the AST and looked for particular calls of particular function and made sure that uh, it was not a, had to be a stir, AST not stir. The MyPy plugin, I took a similar approach here. I uh, looked for all function calls to my particular function here, this sumfunc. I wrote a callback for adjusting the function. Um, and as a side effect of adjusting the function, you don't have to actually adjust the function. You can instead produce an error there. And so as you can see here, I double checked that the, first argument being passed into the function was a literal type. This is almost exactly an implementation of how literal string might work in MyPy. Uh, but this was you know, years before literal string existed, so <laughs> I'm not just showing this because it makes me look perceptive. I'm showing this because it's a real example of how you might implement something like this. Okay, cool. So let's go back to use cases. So one, you know, sanitizing, or not sanitizing, but requiring static values for uh, SQL queries. Another example might be, uh, or another example that I like to show is uh, translations. So for instance, if you've worked with git text, uh, you might imagine that printing a translated value, and usually when you work with a translated string, you want the first value to be a literal. Maybe like, I love uh, language, and you ask for, what is your favorite language, question mark. Uh, and you might pass through, you know, this is the, the string template. You would scan your code and it, was, it would pull out the string literals for the first argument. Sometimes the second argument, if you're dealing with plurals, you would send those off to your translators and you might end up with like an XML file that has the mapping of all of your uh, strings to their translated values in whatever locale you're dealing with. And then at runtime, this function takes that first argument, grabs the translation for the proper language that you want, and then substitutes in whatever the variables are here. I, I haven't worked with this. <laughs> I haven't worked with standard library get text, so I don't know exactly the uh, syntax here, but you can imagine some sort of translation function that looks roughly like this. Now, the cool thing about this, or the uncool thing about this, is nothing about the type system actually forces this first argument to be a string literal. Uh, you might, you know, accidentally write this as you know, a, a dot format here. Dot format, and I actually see this, this mistake all the time. Um, let's, let's put this on two lines so that it see the code. <laughs> uh, 
language equals this. What is your favorite language? Language equals language. Um, I see a mistake that looks like this all the time when dealing with translation frameworks in that like, this looks like it'll work and it'll work in English just fine. Uh, the developer, uh, let's say, <sighs> Uh, stir, to stir. I don't know. Return x dot format star star params. Imagine that that's how good text is implemented, but we're just putting in a substitute function here. Um, so let's say my favorite language is not Python. <laughs> uh, and it looks like it works. It looks like it works in English. And, you know, the developer tried it on their laptop. They only speak English, so they've only tried it in English. You know, it, it's, it looks subtly correct from a code review perspective. Maybe it made it through code review. And this goes straight to prod. You know, no problems happen here. Unfortunately, as soon as you try and run this in a different language, maybe this is like lang equals, or let's say, let's say lang equals en us. And we have translations being, I don't know. Uh, well, you would scan this and it wouldn't work. But let's say you scan this and somehow you're, you're uh, your lo localization framework figured out that it's in US is still the same string. Uh, maybe in uh, ES US Spanish, it's <laughs> a mi me gusta language. I don't have the accent, but trust, close enough. Um, and you might say, uh, Formatster equals translations lang and then formatster dot formats. Maybe you've actually implemented this properly. Uh, and you would go to try this in Spanish, ESUS, and run this particular piece of code, you know, uh, Python and then translations X. Uh, Python, and I mean, it would crash. <laughs> Actually, usually they're implemented by saying dot get x dictionary dot get lang the original string. Uh, so you would still see, you would still see this as the untranslated English, even though we tried to set this as Spanish up here. Now, just to show that this would work if we had done this correctly, instead of calling dot format here, we would do something like this, and now that we're in Spanish, Python, a mí me gusta Python. Great. The, the annoying thing is the type checker by default isn't gonna help you find this bug. Uh, if we you know, call dot format here and we uh, ask the type checker, is this code okay? I mean, I didn't make any other mistakes here. All right, so this. Uh, it's gonna say there's no warnings or errors here. But if we force this translation string parameter to be literal string, literal string from port literal string, we can enforce that every call to this localization function must have a, uh, a, a, a programmer written and not computed value as value here. And you can see here now the pirate's gonna point out, hey, you passed sir instead of a literal string. Whereas if we had done this correctly, instead of calling dot format here, now of course T strings sort of make this a moot point and or give you another tool to solve the same problem in a different way. But uh, you can see that Pirate is now enforcing that this must be a programmer written value, uh, which I think is really nice. Like this is a, a, a cool tool to be able to force an invariant on the code that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Um, I did want to show one other use case, or at least talk about one other use case without going into details, because uh, this is actually a use case that I run into all the time at work. It's very frustrating. Uh, and that is feature flags or options, things that you have like a named value that maybe you flip it from true to false, and you might look it up as something like, you know, is enabled option name, uh, I don't know, returns pool. Maybe, maybe you have some magical function, it looks at a YAML file or a database or who knows where you're getting your options from, environment variable. Uh, and these option names are something that might be hard coded. So you might say something like, if is enabled, I don't know, feature dots, uh, 
<laughs> what's what's a what's a thing that might be enabled? I don't know. Deals. Silly silly name. Uh, you know, if is enabled, feature not deals. Print. You know, get fifty percent off. Blah blah or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> silly example. Uh, but these feature flags are probably something that you want to make sure are up to date, match something in your uh, configured featured values. And when you're done with the feature flag, you want to be able to clean them up later. If you allow just arbitrary strings here, that means that your developers are going to do cheeky things where, I don't know, they might format a value into here. Uh, they might you know, take this from a database value. They might do all sorts of other stuff that make it really hard to audit whether these are actually used or not. But if you force them to be literal string, this gives you a much better utility or, or a better way to figure out, you know, is this actually used? Because you know, you know that the values are going to be written literally in code. And so you can just wrap around your code base for a particular feature name and know whether it's used or not. Um, and so I think that's another, another case that I really like for this. The way to force this to always be a literal value, never a computed value, never a variable, never a user generated variable. Uh, it has to be something that the program wrote. Uh, unfortunately, the feature flag system that we use at work doesn't enforce this invariance right now. And so <laughs> it's a big pain in the butt to figure out what stuff is used or not anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to walk through a little string, show you a few examples of how you might use it, uh, go over this idea that I had long before it existed. Uh, it's new in Python 3.11, but you can always uh, import the back port from typing extensions. Import literal string. Uh, unfortunately, MyPy doesn't have support for this right now. It just treats it as stir, so it, it doesn't do the enforcing part, which I think is actually really important. But at some point, this MyPy issue will get solved, and then uh, it'll have uh, support for this. Or you know, maybe you could go add support for this. <laughs> Because uh, honestly, I don't think it's going to be too much more complicated than what I wrote in this MyPy plugin here. Of course, you probably need to teach MyPy about literal uh, literal string as a type and then you know, feed it through all the plumbing. But I don't know, one day MyPy will have support for this, which is nice. But anyway, hopefully you found this useful. If there are additional things you would like me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.